So I'm sure by now most of you have heard of glyphosate. For those of you following me in Australia, you probably know it as Roundup. This is a very common herbicide pesticide that's used in agriculture and has been used for a long time and has quite a bit of controversy around it. There's you know, some data looking at potential aspects of it being a carcinogen, and yet it's still being used widely both in Europe and in North America and obviously here in Australia. And there was a recent article published by The Guardian here that was looking at this common compound glyphosate actually being found in sperm, um, and that's particularly in sperm of infertile men. And so this popped up on my feed, and so I thought I would dive into it and look at the actual paper and the research and what it says so we can dive in to see you know, how much this is potentially affecting men's health and then also hopefully give you guys a couple strategies and things that we can do towards the end to minimize our exposures and also work on trying to clear this from our body. So make sure you stay to the end um, when we get to that. And of course, if you want to support the channel and the content that I'm doing here, make sure you like and subscribe as it really helps out the channel and get it in front of people. All right, well, let's look at the actual paper and what the paper was looking at. So this is the paper itself that the article was based on. It's uh, glyphosate presence in human sperm. First report in positive correlation with oxidative stress in an infertile French population. And so it is a first looking at actual uh, samples of sperm in vivo, so actually in people. There have been a lot of animal-based studies on glyphosate and also um, some in vitro studies looking in cell culture. But this is one of the first to actually look at it in vivo in men. So um, this was just recently published. I believe this was May 2024. Um, and it's a French cohort. And so that's an important thing to note first. The area that people were um, from are actually from one of the main areas. They outline it here. So we had 128 um, partners of infertile couples uh, aged 26 to 57. And it's important to recognize here that uh, the entire cohort was infertile. So keep that in mind when we're talking about the causative role of glyphosate in infertility, because um, what we'll see is how many people actually had exposures. Um, but the, the study was actually conducted in this area in France um, at the center of Paul Sante Leonardo da Vinci, which is in the middle of uh, a particular area which is both urban and somewhat rural, but it's actually a main area for grain and wine production. And so this is actually one of the areas that has uh, quite a high exposure in France to herbicides. So it's probably a good cohort to look at um, when we're looking at the nature of glyphosate exposure. And um, again, as I said, keep in mind that this entire cohort was infertile. So um, they're all from this area. So there could be something else in this area. It could be other compounds, could be other things related to it, not just the glyphosate. But when we talk about glyphosate, you know, we said there's quite a bit of controversy. It has been researched and you know it has been approved for use by EPA and European groups as well but there is growing evidence to show that it's potentially harmful as we said it's um, been shown to potentially be a carcinogen um, that was by an international group but we have a lot of animal studies which we can see here that shows that glyphosate exposure can have a range of damaging effects on the body both neural liver renal reproductive toxicity and the reproductive toxicity has already been shown in uh, model animals in mammal animals as well such as uh, mice and whatnot um, and furthermore you've probably seen some of this that there's a growing concern of a lot of these compounds being found in our bodies so we already have research to show that uh, glyphosate and the uh, metabolic compound from glyphosate has already been shown in urine, in serum, in maternal milk, umbilical cords, hair, in our gut, um, and uh, not to date in human sperm. And that's what this looked at. So obviously we're having a growing amount of exposures to this glyphosate. And so it's probably important to actually test this uh, and see you know, what are the long-term effects? What are the effects on fertility? What are the effects across generations? And across generations is really important because what we look at uh, later in this study is uh, looking at some epigenetic effects in the germline, which may affect future generations. So uh, let's dive through. So as I said, there were uh, 128 um, participants, male participants, so not a massive study, um, but enough at least to get a decent sample size. They did some subjective questionnaires as well to see, you know, what profession they were in. Um, as we said, you know, those exposed to obviously agriculture and farms, we know typically have higher exposures. Um, but they also looked at people from uh, professional uh, sort of more metropolitan types of jobs as well. Uh, unfortunately, only a few people, 47 of the 128, fully filled out their forms. So we'll keep that into consideration when we look at some of the analysis later on. 
And what was good about this study is they measured, obviously, both in blood and in um, the sperm, the amount of glyphosate and some of the metabolites, but they were also looking at measures of oxidative stress um, and antioxidant capacity. So they looked at both total antioxidant status, uh, total oxidant status, and then the oxidative stress index. So we're getting some measures of what are their antioxidants and oxidant status like um, in the testes and in the uh, sperm. And then they also further measured more specific and direct markers of oxidative stress, particularly this MDA, um, and 8-hydroxy-DG. 8-hydroxy-DG is an important one because this is actually a measure of DNA damage. So when there's oxidation of guanine in one of the base pairs, this metabolite is produced, and uh, we know that this suggests DNA damage. Obviously, when we're talking about DNA damage and fertility, that's problematic. If we have any damage occurring um, to the DNA in the germline within the sperm, um, that can potentially lead to various uh, disorders um, or just general infertility because the, um, the egg itself will not, be, uh, will not grow properly. So it's great that they looked at a couple of these different measures and it's quite comprehensive. Uh, and these will be important when we look at some of the effects. Now, what was interesting, actually, before we get into that, we'll just um, look at how much glyphosate was detected across. So they found over 50% um, had detectable levels of glyphosate in the uh, blood and in the uh, seminal plasma. Seminal plasma is the actual plasma with the sperm itself, the, the entire fluid. And so more than 50%, so 73 out of the 128 had detectable levels. But remember, the entire cohort is infertile. So only about half of these infertile people had glyphosate. So that in and of itself says we can't necessarily say that the infertility was the, um, the glyphosate was the cause of the infertility, but it's certainly interesting to look at its potential effects. Um, what was surprising is that the glyphosate levels were actually nearly four times higher in the seminal fluid than in the blood. Uh, and they discuss this and suggest that there might be some level of bioaccumulation that occurs in the testes and in the semen. And some of this may be mediated because of damage to the blood testy uh, barrier. And so if the blood testy barrier is damaged, this can obviously cause effects and damage to our testes and allow other um, other types of compounds to pass the barrier uh, and affect our testes and affect our sperm. So that alone is already not a great thing. Another thing that they found was that the uh, concentrations were actually not that significantly different. So here we see not significantly different between those living in the city and in the countryside or between patients eating organic or non-organic. So that's very surprising because typically the notion um, that we look at is we want to minimize our exposure to glyphosate by trying to eat organic. Um, and obviously we know that, as we've already said, those exposed to farms and agricultures tend to be higher. Um, but it was surprising that they didn't find a massive significant difference between those. The, the caveat to that is probably the fact that all of these people live in this uh, area in France where they have a high amount of wine and grain-based agriculture. And we know that that can dissipate into the soil, into the water and everything. So maybe there's already a higher baseline in this population than say other populations in the city. However, they did find um, concentrations almost twice as high in smokers. And this is likely because a lot of tobacco is sprayed with glyphosate and other herbicides. So if you're a smoker, then you already know you're going to be doing a lot worse damage as far as your glyphosate exposure. Uh, let alone all the negative effects we know of smoking. And if you listen to this channel, hopefully you're not smoking. That should be a no-brainer if you care about your health and longevity. Um, so let's look at some of the actual results. Now, the first thing they looked at was the uh, quality of the sperm itself. And surprisingly, they actually didn't observe any significant difference between those who had higher levels of glyphosate and non-detectable glyphosate in the sperm concentration, in the motility, or the sperm morphology, which is surprising because um, you'd think there would be some significant difference. But keep in mind again that this entire cohort is infertile, so maybe there's already some issues with their concentration, motility, and morphology which would be indicative of, of um, having infertility. So we'll keep that in mind. I'm still surprised. I thought there would be some difference there, but there are still significant findings across. Um, here we can just see in some of these charts, the significant amount of exposures. So we can see here almost four times 
on the side, we have our seminal plasma here versus blood plasma. We can see significantly higher amounts in the, uh, in the seminal plasma compared to in the blood. So again, tying into that aspect of potential bioaccumulation. So uh, let's look at the actual oxidative status and antioxidant status. So this is where we start to see some significant differences between the group. So they did find that the total oxidative status and the oxidative stress index were significantly higher uh, in the men who had glyphosate exposure in both the blood and in the seminal plasma. So this would suggest that there is certainly some increased amount of oxidation and oxidative stress in that area, which that alone is not going to be great because we know that those types of things, particularly in the testes and in the sperm, um, can be detrimental to fertility, can be detrimental to testosterone as well. So for overall men's health, we don't want an excess amount of oxidative stress occurring there. Some is normal, but we don't want too much. This was further supported um, by finding that the uh, metabolite MDA of oxidative stress was higher again in the men with glyphosate, both in blood and seminal plasma. And also the marker 8-hydroxy-DG was observed to be higher. So not only is there more oxidative stress, but there also seems to be a higher amount of DNA damage, again, which I've already stated um, is problematic when we're looking at things like fertility or overall health of the testes. And we can see this outlined here in these charts. So we can see very clearly uh, the correlation between the amount of glyphosate exposure and the amount of um, total oxidative stress and oxidative stress index. So uh, in orange here, we've got the seminal plasma. We can see it's significantly higher, but even regardless, both in blood and in seminal plasma, um, we've got a trend line moving up with a trend of 0.64. So that's pretty positively correlated. Um, one to one is you know the most it can be. So 0 0.64, 0 0.65 is a significant um, correlation. And we can see that moving up and to the right. So obviously the more glyphosate exposure you have, the more oxidative stress there tends to be. Um, and we see that in the oxidative stress index as well. So we can see significant difference between the two groups. And here we can see the same thing with the other two metabolites, the MDA and the 8-hydroxy-DG. You can see that 8-hydroxy-DG is even more significant when we're comparing the exposure in the blood versus the seminal plasma. Uh, and that's probably because, again, sperm being a germline, anything that's going to be damaging to the DNA is particularly bad. And, and sperm don't have a robust DNA repair mechanism, unlike some of our other cells. I believe they only have one mechanism of doing that. So anything that disrupts that will be highly damaging. Um, and again, we can see with the MDA quite high as well. And why this can be particularly problematic is because of the epigenetic aspect. So like I mentioned at the beginning, what might happen is we can see, and there is some data to show that there can be uh, transgenerational effects. So anything that affects DNA and epigenetics, particularly here, they saw changes and there's studies to look at changes in DNA methylation that can affect the next generation. So um, if these people did manage to get pregnant and have a child, that next generation child may be more susceptible to other diseases because of the change to the epigenetic markers or because of a, a lack of methylation that occurs during development. So that's definitely problematic. And these are the types of things that we probably need to research further and understand the long-term transgenerational effects of glyphosate before we blatantly just approve it everywhere. And so that's definitely significant and something that we wanna be mindful of. I would say based on these alone, uh, we, we want to do everything that we can to minimize our potential exposures to glyphosate. And to make things worse, you know, they even have shown that there can be negative effects below the acceptable limits. So there's the non-observed adverse effect level. Um, what some research has shown is we know that glyphosate can negatively affect the mitochondria and respiration and other things, and, and the mitochondria are quite dense in the sperm um, below the acceptable daily intake. So these definitely need to be reviewed and like most things, you know, it's the same thing as lead. There's probably no safe exposure to it um, if we're talking about optimal health. One of the reasons that they suggest for the fact that they didn't see significant changes in the sperm um, across the groups could be because in the formulations that contain glyphosate, there's often different types of chemical compounds in there. And so there may be other effects related to some of these other adjuvants and other um, herbicides and pesticides that are used in conjunction with glyphosate. And so they probably need to do a deeper dive into some of those things. And that was probably one of the main, main limitations.
The other thing that they outlined here, unfortunately, they didn't look at testosterone. I would have loved if they did, because obviously for us men, we want to make sure we're optimizing our testosterone for health overall. Um, they didn't look at that here, but they did talk about some other studies recently that did look at it. Um, and in other animal models, they have shown impaired testosterone synthesis, so both in mammals and in birds. And we know that glyphosate can disrupt the transcription and activity of some of the components within the steroidogenic pathway that leads to testosterone. There is some mixed data, which they outlined below, showing that in some models it doesn't necessarily directly affect, but the fact that there's some mixed, that there's some that does show, um, plus we know that there's the aspect of increased oxidative stress and DNA damage within the testes, plus the effects on the blood testy barrier, uh, I would suggest that for optimal testosterone, we probably want to avoid having glyphosate there. So that's in deep the study that they looked at. I think it was a relatively well done study. It's great that they looked at a lot of different markers. Um, clearly, there seems to be some effect of glyphosate having uh, increased role in oxidative stress and DNA damage, which we know can affect both fertility and the overall health of the testes. Um, but keep in mind that the entire cohort was infertile. So we can't say from this that it's directly causative, but there's definitely data to show that it may be problematic. So that leads us to what can we do? The, the best thing, like most things, is to avoid it entirely. Now, even though this study showed that there was no significant difference between organic and non-organic eaters, uh, it is still best practice to eat organic-based foods to minimize exposure to glyphosate. The caveat to that is that, unfortunately, even some organic herbicides and pesticides that are being used in organic produce um, can be just as bad or even worse than glyphosate. For example, something like copper sulfate is being used quite a bit, which is um, quite damaging and quite bad, not only for our health, but also for soil and environmental health. So even when you're going organic, unfortunately, we, we still have some exposures we have to be mindful of. And so um, the best thing you can do with all produce, particularly things where you're going to be eating the skin or something like that, where there's direct exposure, is to actually soak your produce um, in water and baking soda for a little while and then actually wipe it off and give it a, a nice strong clean off with just water. That will get rid of almost all of the residues on your produce. So that's the best strategy. There are a lot of videos on YouTube on how to do that, but that's the best thing to do. And then of course, the other aspect is just supporting our detoxification pathways um, and also minimizing our exposures to other toxins. So like smoking, smoking, like alcohol, like all those other toxins, the more we can reduce the overall load on our kidneys and our liver, the better that they can function to help clear a lot of these things. Uh, and then we can do things like uh, sauna to help detoxify, obviously using things like uh, milk thistle, tudka, uh, methionine, other types of compounds which we know help support liver detoxification pathways. If you're interested in those types of things and you want to go through a bit of a detox program or do a deeper dive and actually measure some of the potential environmental toxins in your blood, I do work with people so you can book a discovery call and we can look at what testing we can get done and also what kind of protocols that we can incorporate for you that are going to be personalized to your specific exposures to optimize your health. But that's all for now. Hope you guys enjoyed the review of that research. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And like I said at the beginning, please leave me a like and a subscribe as it's going to really help out my channel. All right, I'll see you guys in the next one.